I'm going to talk about fully distributed applications and how we're building platforms towards them uh, at Protocol Labs. And uh, I'll give a bit of context about Protocol Labs uh, just to give you a sense of um, how we work, uh, how we go about problem solving, and uh, the, the stack that we're building and the models for it. So it's, it's a, a lot, it's like, think of it like a, as a, an introduction where each paragraph like, uh, starts pretty broad, but uh, we condense down. Uh, so we're in this uh, amazing period of history where we're wiring up all of the planet and connecting ourselves and building this amazing nervous system and building a, a computing platform, an application platform that anybody can use. Um, and the properties of the internet and the properties of, of the underlying substrate for these applications uh, have, are now having far-reaching implications uh, into human lives. So the security and privacy of the application data or the reliability of whether or not the application can work um, is not only meaning whether or not can people work that day, now it can be, in many situations, life or death. So, um, and as we saw in uh, recent, you know, like the last second and a half, uh, now very important movements are starting to rely on these applications, sometimes relying on social networks like Twitter and Facebook and so on um, to, you know, uh, we saw the spring revo uh, revolutions in, um, in, in the Middle East as, as one example of the reliance placed upon these systems. So <laughs> they better work well, right? Uh, it, they better work well in case of, of um, certain kinds of uh, problems or disasters where the internet might be split or, um, you know, and, and, and you have to, you know, you can't reach the backbone or they need to work well in situations where uh, there might be huge attackers that are trying to collect uh, all of the, this uh, information and use it against you in some way. So um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of problems and, and we tend to decompose problems and think about pr starting projects to, to address uh, some of those problems. And uh, over time, we tend to uh, refactor projects and say, oh, well, this thing is actually quite big and maybe we can decompose some subsets. So, uh, we started with the IPFS project, and that ended up yielding a number of other projects along the way, and we recurse. Uh, so, I think the you know th these are the kinds of things that we we end up thinking about. I'm not going to go into detail. I think everybody here is pretty familiar with these. This is just to give you um, a sense. Uh, so, a bit about Protocol Labs, uh, just to kind of um, set the uh, answer. I guess uh, some questions. We tend to think of. Uh, ourselves in this like stellar nursery model of saying, let's think about the problems and the potential solutions um, in one space and then kind of construct a project that could solve it and then think about um, uh, growing it over time and building a community around it. Uh, and so this is why you, we end up with a number of different things that um, have their own identity and their own communities and so on. And uh, Protocol Labs as an organization is, is built around the idea of this pipeline of, of uh, going from ideas all the way to human superpowers. So we, again, live in an amazing time where uh, uh, we can go from conceiving of things and doing, doing research into, uh, and, and moving that research into development and moving that development into, into, some, into deployment into people's hands um, and give people a human superpower. And, uh, in, the, in the 20th century that involved hardware and that was expensive and hard. Now with software and uh, application platforms like the web, we can make this extremely fast. So again, uh, somebody can sit at a computer, um, program uh, a, a, an application, and then grant a superpower to other humans. Now the problem though is, uh, what are the reliability guarantees of that superpower? Is that superpower actually going to work uh, in light of a whole bunch of uh, potentially problematic conditions? Uh, and so what's happening now is humans are starting to rely on a lot of these things, um, often without understanding when they might break. So uh, we should build robust foundations and good primitives so that application builders can build really good software. Uh, and this pipeline is not linear, of course. It really kind of goes all over the place. Sometimes uh, we start with something that exists and think about how can it be improved. Uh, sometimes we think of, of new ideas and kind of sift them through. Sometimes we take ideas that already exist that other people came up with and say, oh, wow, this is awesome. Why, why hasn't it been built? Let's uh, think about building it. Uh, another, another thing to mention about this pipeline is that in these stages, there exists a number of harsh filters that have nothing to do with the idea itself or the viability of the idea uh, and are mostly about 
uh, just humans and, and building things uh, and, and what humans are good at. So sometimes, you know, a lot of great labs produce a number of, of ideas that, um, based on how uh, academia works today, they get produced, but it's really hard to then get them to actually exist in the real world's applications. And moving in, translating in this pipeline might take decades in some cases. So you can look at IPFS as an example of this, where the vast majority of the ideas that went into IPFS had been uh, conceived of probably 10, 15 years prior, and it just took a while for the, that to become um, uh, possible to, to actually build. Uh, or, or actually, it was possible, it's just people hadn't done it yet. Um, we work openly and we work with a lot of people around the globe. Uh, so this is a shot of um, a subset of our con uh, contributors on GitHub. Um, and we try and do, uh, yeah, we try to do as much as we can through GitHub. And uh, that involves both uh, research in some cases, uh, a lot of development across you know, hundreds of repositories, uh, and so on. Uh, kind of looking at it a bit by the numbers, we have two large ecosystems forming, uh, one around IPFS, another uh, around Filecoin, and 12 large projects, uh, over 500 GitHub repos, 500 re reusable mod modules. We, we really value this, so we, we try as much as possible to, whenever we implement something, to refactor things out so that others could use the intermediate pieces. Um, sometimes maybe to a fault, but... <laughs> uh, <laughs> But we try, we try hard to, to uh, make the components uh, we make uh, just improve other things, even if uh, we end up not relying on them later. Uh, we have a lot of contributors, uh, and it, all of what we do would not be possible without uh, our uh, huge community. So yeah. Uh, in terms of research, we, I mean, this is kind of a hard thing to measure, but you know, we a basic accounting of just like the notes that we've collected about, about a number of ideas, some big, some small, is in the hundreds. Um, we're starting to structure uh, kind of more formal and, and some quasi-informal collaborations. We have eight researchers, eight plus researchers, either in full-time or, or part-time capacity. And we are starting to um, publish proper uh, papers. Uh, we're starting with a series of technical reports, and we're now going to move towards uh, actually publishing uh, papers and conferences. And uh, we have three open RFPs. We're, you're going to hear about that um, from Evan. And so we, we have structured now a proper research lab. Uh, and you know, Evan will tell you all about the, the details, of, details of that. So I wanted to briefly mention that with all of these projects, there's extensive documentation on the web. You can find out about each of them. Um, there's a bunch of talks talking about uh, the projects. So this introduction is like very, very uh, short and tailored to the problems that we have here today uh, in thinking about uh, CRDTs and thinking about uh, the distributed model in which we want to operate. All right, let's shift gears to uh, the good stuff. So the protocols and the models and, and so on. Uh, this is the stack that we're thinking about. Uh, we start with a, a kind of promise around future proofing and upgradability. We want all our protocols to not fail because maybe people move to use a different transfer protocol. Sometimes that happens, and that's a shame. Uh, or you know, a hash function. You, you choose a hash function, and you bake it into everything you do, and suddenly the cost of moving from one hash function to another becomes extremely difficult. Uh, we also don't want to. Uh, be victims of the fragmentation in the, in the network stack. We want to bind all of the network uh, together. And so we built a, a system and, and library for, for doing that. And I'll explain this a bit more. We have a way to model uh, authenticated data structures where uh, we kind of treat all data as potentially authenticated data structures. And we have a way of translating between different systems. So I'll explain a bit more of how that works, but this is kind of a refactoring of the heart of IPFS and, and treating all data available um, that can hash link uh, as, a, as the same kind of data structure. IPFS is the much more, much more concrete thing here. It's a project for uh, distributing files and um, building fully distributed applications that can work offline or in a disconnected environment. Uh, and I'll walk a bit through an example of that. Uh, that's uh, where we are. And then 
uh, Falcon is a project around um, incentivizing a huge network around the planet to form uh, to build a, a properly decentralized storage market that, that is not controlled by any one party. So uh, this, I'll mostly be focusing on these three. Um, primarily, here is where CRDT land uh, exists. Uh, but it, it would be then available and usable by all the applications ab above. So the, um, the observation of, of IPLD is that when you look at data structures like Git or Plan9's file system or BitTorrent or Bitcoin or Ethereum or all these things, um, there are Merkle trees. There are data structures that use hash linking to address each other. And if there are a whole bunch of Merkle trees, why can't we uh, bring them together in some huge Merkle forest, right? And be able to address from one to the other and be able to move through them similar to how you can mount different kind of file systems in your, in your OS. Or in the web, how you can access a bunch of different URLs, uh, whether or not they're hosted in the same provider or, or using the same uh, databases and so on. So it's a, that was a kind of the basic idea and that you know, turned into a huge rabbit hole of thinking about <laughs> computation and execution models and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but the basic idea is thinking of primitives for enabling uh, software developers both at, at the platform or application level to build um, things that can take advantage of all the n nice things about authenticated data structures and make it work well and play well with everything else. So this leads to a distributed programming environment. So think of things like Bloom. Um, I think of things like uh, like a distributed closure, maybe uh, Erlang and so on. So, so this is the kind of model that this is pushing towards. Uh, so at a basic level, it's a series of formats that can help you bind all these data structures together. But at a, at a much deeper level, it's, it's a, a thinking of, of a programming system that doesn't start with the IDE and the runtime in one process, but thinks about the runtime across all machines on the planet, whether or not they're connected. Uh, there's a lot embedded in that, so I'm not going to dive into detail, but happy to discuss with people if they're interested in that. Uh, what lip 2 p is, uh, so I'm going to jump down the stack for a moment, uh, is a, a project that just tries to abstract away the network um, in, as, in as efficient and convenient way as we can make it, um, but that preserves the flexibility of the underlying network. So today, uh, the web does not really work over things like Bluetooth. Uh, you, you have to try really hard to get that to work. Uh, most br stock browsers and servers and so on wouldn't work over that kind of transport. And if you want to try to use something uh, safer like Tor, uh, you, you also have to go at great lengths to either enable um, uh, your use as a proxy or set up your own hidden service and so on. Um, it's quite difficult. Uh, also, the reliance on TCP as a single um, transport made it extremely difficult for other transports like SCTP and DCCP and a whole bunch of others, a whole bunch of like you know acronym letter, uh, soup, to uh, it prevented all of those protocols from uh, ever bringing their benefits to applications. And, and the observation was, well, hey, look, the end-to-end -end principle was broken. What if we try and fix it by creating a, a network stack that lives in the application layer but could be moved down, um, but you know, it's application first? That abstracts away all of that and enables applications to just run uh, with opaque network addresses and, and identifiers. Uh, and as long as you c one application can connect to any other node um, and can find a route through whatever transports it, it, it has, uh, then that should work. Uh, you shouldn't have to, as an application developer, rewrite your application to make it work over Bluetooth. Uh, that should just work transparently. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, what, what uh, Lip2P is about. But one of the important things here is it does not rely on any, any kind of um, existing network infrastructure or centralized ne network infrastructure to the point where you could split the network in half or in whatever pieces. And the nodes that can still connect to each other should be able to continue operating just fine. Uh, you could be completely offline on your own or, or connect with the rest. So this is the part of our stack that deals with all of the peer-to-peer -peer magic that you need in order to make this work in today's pretty, um, pretty crazy networking environment with you know, tons of different kinds of protocols and so on. So this is a toolkit that uh, solves a, a whole bunch of problems uh, to enable that to happen. And so you have things like peer routing and connection setup and nat traversal 
and uh, a whole bunch of different kinds of encryption channels and so on just to make this possible. But the idea is that out of this, uh, you, you, you sync all of, those, all of that hard work into this layer, and out of that you get a really nice environment for applications where all you have to do is have an identifier for another, another peer, which is their, their ID, um, and you have a routing system that can find addresses for that ID, and then you can set up an encrypted channel between them and then start uh, operating. And again, that is not really even bound to IP. You could have this work running on any kind of network. The, the other thing I'll mention is, is IPFS. I, um, the, think of this as an application platform that combines this nice lib2p networking thing with the authenticated data structures world and says, let's just build a file system on top of that and expose it to the web. And so now be able to, to look at files and, app, and web apps and so on directly through the browser uh, as the main viewing point. And you're able to access all kinds of, uh, of, of things in this authenticated data structure model where it doesn't matter where you're getting it from. You could be getting it from a node in your local machine. You could be getting it from a node elsewhere or, or whatever. Uh, and it's all the same content. And you can execute it the same, same way. Uh, we, can, we have demos of this kind of stuff later we can, we can show you. Uh, so I wanted to just talk a bit about three applications to give you a sense of where CRDTs uh, come in. Uh, I guess a, a uh, teaser is this, right? So if we want applications to work in this environment where they can completely split, uh, then, and, and we want things like chat or, or um, uh, collaborative documents and all this kind of stuff, then we need a model that doesn't rely on a centralized database uh, in the cloud somewhere, we need a model that allows convergent uh, data structures to, to, build, uh, to build the state, the shared state of, the, of this application. Now, of course, in our, in our model, we would like to have full, uh, full guarantees despite whether or not people are connected at all ever. That's kind of hard. You get into like really hard questions around um, can you allow to never sync? Uh, what do the logs look like once, once they grow and so on? So a lot of interesting questions there. Uh, also access controls, we'll talk about that later today. So uh, the first application I'll mention is PeerPad. Uh, we we'll, can show a demo later, later today. Uh, but the idea is you have a, a collaborative real-time editor. Uh, you can, uh, a lot of CRDT work, uh, work does this. But what's cool about this is that this works entirely over, over IPFS and, and lib2p. And this is a full um, IPFS node on the browser. So what's going on here is that, is that the first request is, is hitting uh, an IPFS node either in localhost or in a, in a gateway somewhere. And then downloading the payload, which is the application. And then that application runs an IPFS node in the tab, then uses lib2p to connect to the other tab uh, and then how, uh, you start exchanging the, the CRDT log. And so this is uh, you know, an example of an application that's not really in any domain anywhere. Like this, this is, could be loaded from our local IPFS node and it works the same. So it, it, it demonstrates uh, the use case. And so here we, we're already thinking about how do you deal with uh, access controls? How do you deal with sharing uh, documents? So right now it has a capability model. This is uh, fully encrypted and, you, and if you share the the URL, you're sharing a capability and you're allowing other people to write to it and so on. But uh, there's a whole bunch of interesting questions uh, that come when you want to revoke access and, and so on. So yeah, showing the URLs there. Uh, another uh, example is IPFS cluster, where um, right now this relies on consensus, but it's an interesting question as to whether or not this could be a CRDT. Uh, IPFS cluster is a tool that brings together a number of IPFS nodes that want to pool their storage to replicate the same you know, huge data set for you know, reliability and so on, or also being able to address more than would fit in a single computer, and transparently makes these nodes behave as a single IPFS node. So this is kind of a recursive construction where um, these four nodes would then uh, also expose the same IPFS API, and you could still make the same kinds of requests. Um, and they get, it just gets replicated uh, to, to the rest of the nodes and you have a, a traditional consensus model here where you know, things get fully committed into a log and then externalized to, to the user. But there's an interesting question as to whether or not this could actually be a CRDT. Uh, there's no real hard requirement that it needs to be 
to be consensus, uh, there could be a model here that where a zero to t might be a better fit. Uh, this is about like just tracking pin sets. Pin sets is just a, an identifier pointing to a subgraph of a huge tree that we want to back up. Um, yeah, this is kind of showing the recursive construction. There's uh, cluster is a tool that sits next to an IPFS node and can point to um, an API and then works with the other nodes to, to talk to the rest of the world. And I guess the last example is, is chat. So I think uh, the last example is, um, you know, it would be great to be able to have a, a chat application that just works uh, in a completely distributed environment where we in this room could continue talking whether or not the re uh, we can connect to the rest of the world and we could have you know, channels uh, and so on. There's a whole bunch of hard UX questions that appear when, you can, when you're talking in the same channel as a lot of people in the world and you're split with a subgroup and then you merge back a whole bunch of other changes from the rest of the world and how do you display that to the user. So a whole bunch of interesting challenges. But even before we can get there, there's hard challenges on, on things like revocation and so on in large groups, uh, like long lived large groups that um, may or may not uh, be be talking to each other for that, for that duration. Uh, now, there's a whole bunch of other kinds of applications that people are building with IPFS, but that gives you a flavor uh, of a few. And we can probably talk about a lot more. Uh, thank you. That's it for me.